We've known for 25 years that mental illness is not just a Western Hemisphere or an Eastern Hemisphere phenomenon, it's global. We know that mental illness in its most serious forms is devastating to lives. Even in its more moderate forms, it takes away from relationships, it takes away from schooling, it takes away from jobs, can erode the will to live. And it's not rare. Severe mental illness affects about 1 in 20 adults. Moderate forms, closer to 1 in 4 or 1 in 5. And if you include less severe forms, like phobias, and if you go across a person's whole lifetime, 40 to 50 percent of us will experience some form of mental disorder. So this is not 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 10,000. It's number one. Number two, mental disorders appear in every nation we've ever studied on Earth. There are some forms that are relatively particular to certain cultures, but the most severe forms, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, OCD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, are universal. Genes convey a lot of the risk. Early environments can accentuate that risk. Number three, given what I've just said, how devastating mental illness can be and how prevalent it is and how universal, well, of course, we all talk about it. Well, of course, it's just like cancer. Cancer, 75 years ago in the United States, was a very shameful disease that if you got it, it must have been that you'd lost your conviction that life was worth living, you'd given up and you were to blame for it and you never put in the obituary if your family member died of cancer what the cause was, you said died of natural causes or an unknown illness. So today, cancer is accepted and it's fought, it's a battle. In our country, people know more of the facts of mental health, mental illness, than in the middle of the 20th century, but attitudes have not fundamentally changed. It's still shameful, it must have been your fault, it must have been bad parenting, Better to keep it in the closet, better to shut it down, than admit the utter shame of not being fully functional, not having full uh, mental competencies, losing your marbles, all of the phrases we use to describe mental illness. We know more of the facts, but we're still ashamed. And why is that? Well, I wrote two books on the topic. This would take a long time to get into. We all like to feel that we're in control of our behavior. We all like to feel that the world is always a fair place, and if somebody's not doing so well, it must be their fault. Well, in fact, we all differ in how short or tall we are. We differ around the world in our skin color and religious preference. We differ a lot. Some of us are extremely focused, and others are pretty scattered. Some of us have very regulated moods and others of us go from extremes of sadness and elation and back again. Those differences are a lot controlled by genes. Early experience matters too. But the feeling so many of us have is, it must be your fault. It's not your fault how tall you are. You should have just chosen different parents who were taller or shorter. But when it's behavior and emotion, we're socialized to believe that you have it all under your control. Now, with therapy and with self-improvement, people can clearly recover and get better. But the fault of being prone to a mental disorder is no more your fault than the risk of being tall or short. It's largely in the inheritance we have. The shame here the crime here is that if we only accepted and if we only let people express, sometimes I feel so anxious I can't function. Sometimes I feel so sad I don't feel my life is worth living. Sometimes I'm so scattered I can't keep track of a conversation. We have treatments that can really help. We may not have cures. We don't have cures for all forms of cancer yet. We certainly don't have cures for all forms of mental illness yet but we have treatments that can help you adapt and recover. But if you're too ashamed to admit it, 
And if we don't have doctors trained and psychologists trained adequately to help you, because we fund real illness, medical illness, more than mental illness, and think it's more important, then we're in a vicious cycle. People's shame doesn't allow them to seek help. The social stigma doesn't allow treatments to get fostered and researched and promoted. And people stay down rather than lifting themselves up. Mental health is as important as physical health. Mental health and physical health are linked together. We need to talk about it. Mental illnesses are multifactorial. They're multiply caused. Let's take heart disease, coronary artery disease. Yes, it runs in some families more than others. Some genes you inherit make you more, more vulnerable, but smoking and eating an unhealthy diet and failure to exercise can all compound the risk. Mental illness is quite similar. Schizophrenia and depression and bipolar disorder, ADHD and autism. We know that there are genes that you inherit that make you more vulnerable than other people. But it's typically when those genes are put in combination with difficult life experiences and trauma, two plus two starts to equal six. The risk compounds. Is there a single gene that causes any form of mental illness? No, it's much more complicated than that. Can a traumatic experience alone cause mental disorder? Well, we know that if you've been the victim of sexual assault, or you've been a prisoner of war on a horrific war experience, you may be more likely than others to develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But even people who've been exposed to very similar traumas may differ as to whether they get a, a PTSD because there's probably an underlying genetic vulnerability too. It's not all biology. It's not all experience. It's how they come together. The age of onset varies. With autism, autism spectrum disorders, we can reliably detect them at ages one and two, often diagnosed in the preschool years. ADHD, preschool years, grade school years, age four, five, six, seven, eight, although it might not be detected until adolescence or adulthood if, if the person's been able to get by before. Depression can exist in childhood, but its onset is often in the later teen years or early adult years. Bipolar disorder, we used to think only occurred after age 17. We know some children are vulnerable to bipolar disorder, but like depression, like schizophrenia, many forms of mental disorder tend to have their onset in late adolescence, early adulthood, for reasons we don't quite know. A few years after puberty, it may be that certain genes express themselves epigenetically as they're influenced by the environment only during the latter adolescence period. We also know, as I said a moment ago, that it's not just genetic vulnerability, but it's how that set of genes you're born with is expressed by the environment that might trigger my depression when I'm 15, but yours not till you're 35. So certain forms of mental disorder we certainly can see. Many forms of mental disorder, autism uh, being the exception, it's early in childhood, depression, anxiety disorders, we can see in childhood, but the most likely period is adolescence. If we could predict and get the early warning signs ahead of time and start people in treatment early, that would be a huge gain. But if the family's afraid to look, if it's too shameful to even talk about or admit, we'll never get early treatment. Teens don't want to be different from anybody else. They don't want their parents being detectives with them. So there's no simple answer to that question, but often it's a matter of, is the individual, the teen in question, acting pretty differently from the way they normally do? Teens are moody. Teens are unpredictable. We all understand that. But if for weeks at a time the teen is not talkative or is muttering to himself or herself, or you think there may be drugs that are being used, or there's a pattern of extremely erratic behavior, a loss of interest in activities that usually give the teen a pleasure, then we start to ask. Teens don't want to talk about it. Teens would rather hide it. But it's amazing how that if you're persistent as a parent, 
Teens are desperate for contact. We now have ways in the United States and with school-based mental health for teens even before they're 18, before their parents can consent. Until you're 18, your parents have to consent you into treatment, but there may be a school counselor or a peer counselor to talk with to get some early help. Waiting is not a good idea. Yes, depressions often come and go. They come in episodes and cycles. But the next depression may be worse than the one before. And if we just think everything will be okay in a couple of months, this is when we get into risk for suicide and risk of very serious consequences. So you have to know your kid. You have to know that some kids are like clockwork and a little deviation one day is, oh, what happened there? Other kids have a big <laughs> diurnal variation and, and, and a big variation across a month. But if you see signs that the behavior is changing, that the child and the teen is dramatically unhappy or doing things much more erratically than before, it's the time to open up to them. Sometimes kids are resistant and if need be, seek school counselor, seek, seek a private counselor, a therapist, to try to get the kid involved with the family to talk about what's going on. Lack of focus, uh, this will go away, leave me alone, uh, you don't, no one understands me. These are all defenses kids have to keep from getting help. The answer is it depends. If you look back, we're always better at looking back than looking forward, predictions hard. Many kids have certain vulnerabilities, cognitively, physically, emotionally. And if you've got an underlying vulnerability, your foundation's not strong, you're more likely to be rocked by exams or a breakup or a death in the family. But in some cases, the kid has coped very, very well. And in other cases, the stress is so sudden and dramatic that even without early signs, you might find that it's like the bridge that appears sturdy for years and years, and the storm is so great, uh, the bridge falters. There's no perfect prediction science. We can't take your blood and look at your genes. We can't do a scan of your brain to say, you're vulnerable at age 18, I'm vulnerable at age 25. You do the best with the communication you've got and the observations you've got, and you want to keep lines of talk open with your child and your kid when you're when, when not, he's not a child anymore in order to have some understanding and trust because kids, even though they're pushing you away, they want to be supported when they feel terrible. Parenting is a dance. You have to have a partner. You can dance alone, but it's not much fun and you don't look very good in front of the mirror. In any dance, you realize your moves and your partner's moves have to be very much in synchrony. They have to be in sync. Some kids are very shy and tentative with, and withdrawn even in the first months of life. These kids are often very sensitive. And you get clear signs in childhood and adolescence that you've gone too far. You've got to back off and give them some room. Other kids are boisterous and impulsive and active and they fight fire with fire and maybe the family's into a style of communication that's a little more boisterous and a little more conflictual. But you don't know until you react, until you ask, maybe you said something hurtful. Maybe you pushed too hard. The hope is, is the family is resilient enough to weather those storms and the parent makes a modification and the kid makes a modification. What's the secret? Communication. Be observant, look for these changes, look for these kind of drastic alterations from routine. And even if you don't see those signs, you can say, you know, I think maybe I came down too hard on you the other day. Those final exams were really rough. What can we do to um, get on a different tack? Kids love it when adults admit mistakes because they think that parents never admit mistakes and 
the kid thinks he's right and or she's right and the parent thinks they're right and you clash compromise is a good thing pairing is good perfection is a fantasy if 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 you can introduce me to the perfect parent, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to meet that parent and learn from them, <laughs> but I don't think they exist. Psychology, back in the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. thought that autism was caused by parents who were refrigerators. They were so cold, their infants couldn't bond to them. At the same time, the cause of schizophrenia was thought to be a parent who is hostile and controlling and demanding. The child, the kid, the teen needed to form this alternate reality and hear voices to cope with that. We know that that's simply not true. Autism is highly genetically vulnerable. Schizophrenia, also highly genetically vulnerable. ADHD has a similarly high genetic vulnerability, and it's not caused by parents being too lax and, and, and too lackadaisical. However, the causes of a condition, which might be biological in many instances with those examples, don't necessarily dictate what the treatment should be. We can treat schizophrenia with medications, but a supportive family is vital. Stimulant medications are a mainstay of treatment for ADHD, but structured behavioral programs in schools and in homes make a big difference, and they make the effects of the medications magnify. I like to say that we need to take the blame away from parents for most mental disorders, but not the responsibility. So, if my child's condition is largely biological, a parent might say, well, it's in their genes, it's in their DNA. I can't control that. That's not correct. Even for certain conditions, developmental conditions or medical conditions, where there's a very clear biological cause, family support and social support can make all the difference for outcome. They may not cure the disorder, but they help you adjust. Kids with ADHD don't try to be fidgety and squirmy. They don't try to be impulsive and inattentive. But with very consistent parenting and a very consistent school environment, with more rewards given than typical kids get, they can learn to manage their behavior better. The lack of school environment and the lack of parenting didn't cause the disorder, but they can contribute to treatment. Let's take away the blame, but not the responsibility. So is there a correct way to parent every child? Probably not. But we know from much research over many cultures and many, many decades that when a parent has a lot of love and warmth for the child and also has a reasonable amount of structure, so loving and warm and controlling in the right ways and limit setting, authoritative is the term that kids who grow up with authoritative parents tend to have good social outcomes and good academic outcomes. Of course, if you're a skeptic, you could say, well, maybe those authoritative parents passed along genes that make the kids cooperative too. You could only know if you did this in an adoptive sample. But we know from adoption studies especially adoption studies of kids with ADHD. That, and of course, in an adoptive family, there's no genetic relation between the kids and the parents. They share environment, but not genes. Kids in adoptive families who develop ADHD trigger their parents to be harsh and controlling with them. And those control tactics by parents help the kid not to adjust well later, even in a family where the genes aren't shared between parents and kids. So parenting does matter just as much as biology matters. It's the of warmth and limit setting, not just how much you do of either one. So I may say my home is like an army boot camp. Lights are out at 7 p.m. and there's no talking uh, except at meals and 
And if there's not much love that goes along with that, kids get either very compliant or they rebel. But a warm family that encourages their children to grow, that also has some rules, that's probably a good thing. A completely warm family that has no rules, the kids don't eat at the right time, the kids don't do homework, or the kids don't do well at school, that's too permissive. A balance is good in life. Right amount of warmth and love, but you don't suffocate the kids with love. And the right amount of structure and control, but you're not in the army, probably a good thing. One of the aspects of good authoritative parenting, now, it depends on how old the kid is. You don't reason with a one-year-old. You keep them safe. But as kids get older, during mealtime or during neutral moments, you explain the reasons for certain limits. So the kids don't think it's just arbitrary or it's not just descended upon them from the sky. So authoritative parenting has good warmth and good limits, but also reasoning with the child and also pushing the child gently to be more independent. Those are the good aspects of parenting that probably benefit all kids and they especially benefit kids with ADHD who need more structure and probably a little extra love too. Knowing you're loved and valued and having just the right amount of limits is good for, for most kids. Some very creative, self-reliant kids don't need as many limits. Some kids in very large families, they kind of know implicitly that there's a lot of love and warmth and the parents may not to, need to express it as much. Remember, not every family is the same. Kids come into the world with different temperamental styles and the parent's goal is to find just the right amount, not too much, not too little. Parents have usually been thought of as the socialization agents and the kids always respond to the parents. But certain kids are harder to manage than other kids. Certain kids would push almost any parent to yell and scream and get upset. So in psychology, we say it's a transaction. It's not that A causes B, the parents cause the kids' behavior, or B causes A, the kids' behavior causes the parents' behavior. A causes B causes A causes B over time in a transactional cycle. That's probably closer to reality. In a family where the cycle isn't going so well, the kid's defiant, the kid's inattentive, the parents are yelling and screaming, it takes some parent management intervention where the parents learn to observe their kids' behavior more matter-of-factly. They learn how to spend positive time with their kids because there haven't been many pleasant interactions in that household for many months, if not years. And the parents learn to contingently praise and give rewards rather than yell every time the kid misbehaves. And gradually, with a reward program in place, the tables get turned and the family's working together for the common good rather than being at cross purposes. And some parents who have kids with these problems have attention problems or depression problems themselves. And we think it's important that the parents get treatment for their own issues at the same time that they're embarking on these parent management strategies. It's very important mental illness is frequent, as I said at the outset. Many children grow up in homes where one or both parents have mild, moderate, or severe mental illness. What's the most essential aspect of the equation? The parent needs treatment. But the parent needs to recognize that they have a mental illness. But if it's too shameful to talk about and there's no evidence-based therapist around, the cycle repeats itself. If parents can, either with mild depression or severe depression, or mild or severe bipolar disorder, recognize that they have this huge responsibility as parents, but in many ways their first responsibility is to get their own emotions under better control. Medication and therapy often together work best for conditions like this. We've thought for way too long that if a parent develops a mental illness, they're unfit to be a parent. At extremes, if a parent is abusing substances in front of the child, if the parent's hearing voices and the house is chaotic, the child may not be able to live in that house. But the vast majority of the time, 
mental illness doesn't look exactly like that. Anxiety can be treated, depression can be treated, ADHD and a parent can be treated. Everybody benefits and the kid realizes that parents can change too. Pretty good lesson. Of course the answer is it depends. A three-year-old isn't going to gain a lot from a discussion about dad's major depression or mom's schizophrenia. But as a kid gets older, and if the parent needs to be in a hospital for a period of time to get treatment for serious PTSD or schizophrenia, if the child is clearly noticing erratic behavior, it was thought when I was a boy because my father's doctor told him explicitly with his very severe psychotic mental illness, later discovered to be bipolar disorder, for which he would leave the home for three months or six months or 12 months at a time to be placed in terrible mental hospitals back in those days. And my father asked his lead doctor, what do I tell my dear little children? And the psychiatrist said, if your children ever learn of what was then thought to be schizophrenia and the, and the hospitalizations you're enduring, they'll be permanently destroyed. You and your wife are forbidden from ever talking about it. Well, that was to protect the kids. What happens when a parent is gone for months at a time but nobody talks about it? Well, the kid's terrified and starts to think it must be my fault. What happens if the kid sees mom drinking too much? or so depressed can't get out of bed and loses her job, or could think of all sorts of dads in jail. Silence is not the answer. Shame doesn't work because kids start to blame themselves. Does that mean you tell every two-year-old about every fact about a parent? No. You have to be appropriate developmentally. You have to talk in a language the kid can understand. But don't underestimate even young kids. They know when something's wrong. And if the parents working together, or at least the parent who's still at home, can talk to them and help them understand it, it takes the self-blame away. And it might reduce the kid's own chances of developing mental illness later in life. It depends on the age and the, and, and the child. So Dr. Beardsley, William Beardsley, back at Harvard Medical School, who developed a family therapy program called Family Talk. Mm -hmm. And he invented this 30 some years ago for families in which one or both parents had a mood disorder like depression or bipolar disorder. And the therapist works with the parents to develop a narrative, a set of words to talk to the child about what the child's experiencing. But there's nothing up on the chalkboard that says say this or say that. The therapist works with the parent to say, how do you think your kid understands it? What's a word she might understand? How, how might he uh, know better what you've been through? And the kids come back in the room halfway through the session and you rehearse and then you try it again next week with different words. Any conversation is better than what I grew up with, which was absolute enforced silence. That leads to two outcomes. A, I believe the world's a horrible, cruel place, and I don't want a part of it, or B, it must have been my fault, when it actually wasn't my fault. What's important is to get involved in family therapy with a therapist who helps you as parents and the kids in your home come up with a common language together. It's hard work, but it's worth it. With mental health conditions, where the symptoms have to do with behaviors and emotions and self-regulation. Communication's twice as important. Without that, we're not going to get very far. Mm -hmm.